Aloha, and welcome to Olelo Community Media Series on the Hawaii State Department of Education's exciting strategic plan for public schools. I'm Christina Kishimoto, Superintendent of the Hawaii DOE. The 2030 Promise Plan centers on five promises to students to be delivered across all public schools during the next 10 years. This series features an episode on each of these promises. I'll be joined by educational leaders and students who are living out these promises in their communities, spotlighting some of the engaging and innovative learning underway today in our public schools. As the organization that graduates more than 10,000 students each year, the Hawaii DOE is the chief source of talent in the state. The aim of the 2030 Promise Plan is to harness the power and promise of public education to deliver on equity, excellence, and innovation in every school so that all students are ready for college, career, and community and can contribute to building a thriving, sustainable Hawaii. Mahalo for joining us. There are no small promises for our students. Aloha, I'm Jill Kuramoto. I'm joined by Dr. Christina Kishimoto, Superintendent of the Hawaii State Department of Education. We're going to be talking about the Innovation Promise, which states, students will engage in rigorous, technology-rich, problem-solving learning that enables them to solve an authentic community challenges and develop pathways to goals. It's not just a focus on skills and technology literacy, but also about how to apply those skills with the emphasis on creative thinking. Right? Yes, and this is our fifth promise, and it built on the promises before, before innovation. Mm -hmm. We, in order to have school design uh, effectively work in, in partnership with business and industry and be responsive to changes in career pathways and in business and industry, we need to ensure that we are always on the cutting edge or at the cutting edge in curriculum, in our school design, and in the work that we engage our students in terms of their learning process. So we're really excited because we're really talking about uh, encouraging schools to work with business and industry as partners to seek this kind of iterative process in terms of continuous learning, continuous improvement, and also for the Hawaii Department of Education to be the hub of innovation for the state of Hawaii. We're joined now by Stevenson Middle School teacher Trish Morgan and her student from 2018-2019 Esther Kim, who's now a freshman at Roosevelt High School. Now, two years ago, she was awarded a $100,000 Thank America's <coughs> Teachers Grant from Farmers Insurance for an innovative invention Imaginarium. Now, the space provides computers and specialized equipment to students to design solutions to community needs via coding computer-aided design, 3D printing, laser cutting, video game design, and robotics. Wow, thank you so much for joining us. Now tell us about some of the design thinking focused projects that you've developed. Some of the design thinking projects that we have that are really notable is, first of all, we were approached by an alumni of our school. She had two professionally made prosthetics and she was looking for something that was a little more natural and also something that was lighter. And so we took that on as a project and we actually didn't even have a 3D printer at the time, but within a month and a half, we were able to fashion a fully functioning arm for her. One of the troubles that she had is that when she's using her iPad specifically, she's having a hard time with the, the trackpad. And so we took a look at you know the, the design and um, what we came up with was just looking at different types of stylus and testing them out on her screen so that when she uses her phone, then she doesn't have that problem. So she can wow. use the prosthetic finger mm -hmm. and the stylus works for her. That's a design thinking project that was all based on just one individual's needs, super authentic. And that was really just the start of where we've ended here. 
everything that we're doing has really been geared towards assistive technology. And that's a direction that we just, it just ended up that way. Um, because of the success that we had with that project, a lot of the students came in and they were like, I want to do this too, this is cool. <laughs> Um, so this past year, Esther actually and her partner worked on prosthetic fingers for a student in our school. Luckily, we have him in STEM this year. He was really excited, first day of school, came in, are we gonna work on those fingers? I said, yes, we got you. So they made the design. Again, it's on tension string so that when he moves his hand, the fingers will move. And from here on out, we're gonna improve the function, make it as perfect as possible for him. Wow. I said one of the first steps of design thinking is empathy, yes. right? It's meeting with your community or with a potential client and mm -hmm. really understanding what their need is. Can you talk about how that process occurred? So Ms. Morgan always um, teaches us to give back to the community and we're so fortunate to um, be able to receive the grant. So through that, we were able to help somebody at our school and so we first met with him and we listened to what he wanted with the hands, the fingers. And so through the process, we were able to get closer and we also learned more about 3D printing in general. What were some of the kind of questions you asked to really understand the need of this young man? He could function without the fingers, so we, we still wanted to help him a little bit more with that. So we asked him how, what colors he would want if we actually like with the vinyls, we like what additional of, yeah. functionality yeah. he wants. What he would want if we were able to make it for him. That's great. And it must be exciting to be a part <laughs> of this, right? Tell me how it feels. To it felt really good to give back to somebody that is less fortunate than us, and we were able to learn a lot through it. And we're grateful that we're given the opportunity to do this. Well, what have you learned by watching your students go through this? The quality of their work has increased, and when we see success, it's, it's contagious. We all want to be a part of it, and I mean, it's, it's evolved our program. We were doing really low-tech things, and now we're just trying to one-up the last project, you know? So now we're moving in a different direction where we're bringing in Arduino, and we're pulling out these kits and the kids are learning how to code right alongside with using electronics and they're making wearable technology for people who have physical challenges. Your vision of what a school will look like, public school in 2030, is going to be a lot different, do you think? Absolutely. I love the direction we're heading in. I love STEM and where we're heading with STEM and innovation. And for me, I just, I, I love public school. I'm a public school kid and I wanna see more community partnerships, you know, like bring in local businesses, bring in more guest speakers for the kids so that they can learn from business professionals and they can make decisions at a, lo a younger age and understand, you know, like what the career pathways are out there so that you can actually make real good informed decisions. You have a great example of how the Department of Education can be the hub of innovation. We're not just receiving innovative ideas and responding to it, but that we are actually contributing to innovations that we can push out to the field. We want to pay it forward, that's for sure. <laughs> We're grateful for what we have, and that's what I, I ingrain in the kids. We want to make sure that, you know, we're not just takers. We appreciate the grant. We're, we're so happy that we have all those tools. And the kids know, they, they know that we're blessed when we walk in those rooms and we see all that technology. So we want to use it the right way, use it for social good. have the Stevenson kids come here and present these gifts to the kids is a very big deal but what it what's more meaningful is that this was a school project they created these things with their hands and with the 3d printer and with the grant that their teacher received and that means the world to us to know that this is handmade and very special from the Stevenson kids
I just thought of a game that I used to always play and Connect 4 came to mind. So I was like, whoa, that'd be kind of cool if I made a miniature Connect 4 that the kids could play with. So this is how this design came about. There's nothing better than receiving a gift at this time of the year when they're going through some challenging times in their life. Maui High School's award-winning arts and communication program, known as ACOM, provides an introduction to visual, fashion, performing, written, and media arts, and how they apply to concepts including innovation, legal and ethical issues, and communication. They work with clients in the community, providing a range of services from wedding photography and video to logo design and garment printing. Let's hear from some of the ACOM students about their learning experience. In Arts and Communication, or ACOM, there are these four Ps that we truly abide with. Purpose, pride, professionalism, and persistence. So once I was part of ACOM, those four Ps were really instilled in me. I used to be this very shy type of person, but once that I was in the program, I really learned these, especially working with clients, working with the community, working with other teachers and other students. This program is very collaborative. The skills that I learned throughout ACOM was communication and this is important because I learned how to interact with people in the community and without that skill I would probably still be a shy kid and it just helped me open up to more people. So I joined the Maui High ACOM program because I think that I've always been interested in digital media and I've been in it for four years now because I think that it's all about the experiences and opportunities and with ACOM I've gained a lot of them. What drew me to ACOM at Maui High School was that in middle school, I joined the media club and I was very interested in video, all of the production, you know, the filming, the writing, the editing. So with the regular classroom, I think that it's more worksheets and like just paperwork, but with ACOM, I get to touch cameras and really get out within the community because we do stories outside of the classroom, which really helps me with real life experiences. Oh my goodness, ACOM has taught me so many things and given me so many skills, such as time management. Before ACOM, I would procrastinate and I wouldn't get things done. But through ACOM, it has taught me to get things done, to make sure I'm on time, to get things on the due date. In 2030, I hope that the ACOM program in the future will provide more opportunities, if not the same opportunities that I had and I hope that more kids can get out in the community and use their skills. So in 10 years, I hope for DOE classrooms to become more collaborative. I hope for classrooms and of course teachers to embrace change and really embrace the new 21st century approach. So for the upcoming generations, I hope that they get more real life experiences and new opportunities because even if you fail, it's all about the experience and just learning from them. Let's now take a look at Maui High's ACOM team in action. Here's a news segment on school campus safety that they produced as part of the Student Reporting Labs program for PBS NewsHour. Well, when I first came here, I thought it was really big. And like I even had to use a map to try and find my way around. And I think I'm still using it today, like just to check and make sure I know where I'm going. McKaylee Chalmers, a Maui High sophomore, has had her fair share of campuses. But after seven schools and five states, something about Hawaii still stands out. It's nice to be outdoors and get some fresh air. Yeah, Hawaii is a unique environment in that um, I think as all of us here live here know, you know, we have a, a climate that is pretty much comfortable year round. But over the years, Charles Kanishiro, the president of an international architecture firm based in Honolulu, sees a storm brewing in his industry. The majority of our schools in Hawaii are, are older. Um, so they're designed to standards that existed 50 years ago. The more current schools, um, are being designed with school safety in mind. Um, and obviously that's because of you know, Columbine or more recently Sandy Hook. I don't think anybody 20 years ago would have even imagined 
you know, something like that happening in a, in a public school. I mean, we send our kids to go to school to, to learn, not to be killed. What is that? Whole building. Where is that? Oh. Alkinsal has worked as a school resource officer for three years. He says he has noticed that with the rising risk of school violence, there are inherent challenges with protecting schools with multiple buildings. Trespassers can gain access to our campus 360 degrees, making it nearly impossible for us to, to maintain a secure campus unless we had the manpower to hold hand by hand and surround the school. It's uh, pretty much impossible to keep somebody out. There's all this fear now that I might send my son or daughter to school and they may not come home. Uh, and so there's, a, so there's a tendency to want the schools to become a prison. And that's the trade-off. You know, if we design our schools as prisons, then uh, can you imagine the type of education that's going to occur in them? If there was bars displayed, metal detectors that they have to go through, there's this constant unsettled feeling. All of that creates a culture of anxiety and um, hypervigilance, which when you're in a hypervigilant state, which is watching out for danger, you can, it's very hard to learn. Toby Neal, a licensed clinical social worker at Maui Center for Child Development and a previous counselor at multiple Hawaii schools, suspects that fear-driven architecture may detach children from their roots. We did not evolve inside of buildings. And I think the optimal learning environment includes nature. In order to balance the two, a, a good learning environment and a safe area is uh, by having what we call zones of uh, supervision. So instead of less glass, there's actually more glass. Pu'u Kakui Elementary School features large hurricane windows, which can hold form even when cracked to impact. Open areas within immediate distance of protected spaces, unobtrusive chain link gates, which subtly control access points, a campus-wide alert system, and staff distributed so that every corner of campus is under adult supervision at all times. It's not designing a completely um, tragic proof school. You can't do that, and that, that would be a prison. Ultimately, it's about balancing security with nurturing learning environments so students like McKaylee can enjoy what makes school school. She believes children should be able to come to school and just focus on their work and seeing their friends and not have to worry about like their well-being or anything. At its core, project-based learning is long-form learning. It isn't a lesson that's neatly tied up at the end of class. It often involves a real-world challenge that requires cross-disciplinary solutions and a team approach. We're joined now by Pearl City High School teacher Gail Breitner, along with students Aili Watanabe, Lauren Suzuki, Janelle Liang, and Kaylee Noda. They participated in an innovative project working with state partners and developer Castle & Cook Hawaii relating to an infrastructure improvement to support the Coa Ridge development near their school. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So tell us about this Coa Ridge project. So for our project, we basically had to build a bridge that would connect um, to mm -hmm. the new community that was going to be built. So they wanted it to be a bridge that would match the environment and also be able to hold up a lot of weight because there's going to be a lot more traffic on it. How did this idea come about? Yeah. So we started at the heart of it with our content standards. So we knew that we wanted them to present an argument of some sort. And we also knew that we wanted them to build a bridge. So honestly, the core bridge development was lucky because it did happen in our, back, in our backyard. Mm -hmm. The existing bridge there just recently went over a rehabilitation a few years before that. So we thought it would be a good idea to try and get them to see the difference between the existing beam bridge and then have them transform it into a truss bridge. So we started with the standards and then we started with thinking like what it is that they might find engaging to build in the classroom. So what were some of the parameters you had to meet in order to be competitive? Um, we can only use popsicle sticks and wood glue and we're limited to 200 popsicle sticks and it ne needed to be like 24, 24 inches long. Inch. We also had a time constraint okay. and I believe we're not allowed to work on it outside of the class. And so 
was this a team approach? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what were some of the challenges? Time management was really big and keeping yeah. up with their schedule. It was pretty hard to communicate to because we were in different periods, so we had to work outside of class to finish our bridge and presentation. What are some of the lessons that you think you took from this experience? For me, what I learned was that hard work is going to, or if you put in the work, um, you'll get something out of it. Because building these two, it took like hours long to build, and even like working with other people, and you get great friendships out of it too. That was really nice. I learned how to become more efficient in my work because at first I spent like two popsicle sticks on just making this one side really straight, but then I ended up wasting a lot of time and a lot of material, which I believe is something that I shouldn't do in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so these lessons you can connect, you think, beyond uh, schooling to the workforce? Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. And without this project, I probably wouldn't have known about the new bridge that they're building and the new community that they're making. Yeah. And if you're interested in engineering and design work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I am. Like, <laughs> I like, I like hands-on stuff more than like just studying, like paperwork, bookwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I learn more from hands-on than just straight studying and reading and writing. Yeah, this project was different than other projects that we did before mm -hmm. because it gave us a lot of freedom and different ideas to work with. It also relates to real life because it's not like, oh, how many apples did Johnny eat? It's actually like, how does this affect people in our community? Mm -hmm. You don't want to know how many apples Johnny ate? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not a builder, right? Right? <laughs> So one of, the one of the conversations we've been having is, you know, this charge, uh, this kind of call to action to teachers around rethinking how we engage students in learning. We've heard from four fabulous students around. Mm -hmm. They want to be more hands-on, relevant. Uh, important questions that they can answer. Uh, what does that make you think about? I actually think that it, at, at its core, I think for me as a teacher, it actually is quite liberating because for once, I don't have to be the authority. We actually learn side by side. And these ladies taught me quite a bit about bridges, tension, compression, because I'm actually their English teacher. And they have also did extensive research in that area to teach me that that area actually had night marchers and it has mm -hmm. a lot of historical uh, relevance. So for me too, as a teacher, I, I don't feel like I have to know all the answers all the time. And it's quite liberating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the range of mm -hmm. disciplines that are involved in exactly. this type of learning just becomes so much more elevated. It, it goes beyond po what I call pocket teaching, where you're just teaching English or social studies and science uh, independently. All three content areas are woven together where it's so seamless, you can't tell where one content ends and one begins. And it becomes a little more, I think for them, easier to handle mm -hmm. the uh, overarching goal of what it is that we want them to achieve. And there's so many few jobs, right, that would that we could find. I don't know if there's any that we can find that's just related to one content mm -hmm. area, right? Everything is interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And so learning in that way and how you've described it is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions that, if given the choice, you would ask your teacher to kind of design a lesson around another key question that you'd like to have answered? Um, right now, I can't think of any, but I really like how it's, like real life situation. So if there's any like problems like right now that anyone like wants to solve, if that was like a project that we do based off of that, I think I would find that really interesting for me. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited to see where you guys go from here. <laughs> Our next group of engineers and women too. That's fantastic. So thank you so much for being here. And thanks for sharing your experience and congratulations once again. That's huge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kishimoto, additional thoughts about the innovation promise? Well, Joe, I think you would agree that innovation is a cornerstone of powerful uh, instructional practices. It's so important to our strategic vision for our 2030 plan, and we're so excited that we're making this shift in how we're instructing students, how we're engaging them in learning, and how our teachers, our Kumu, are designing uh, learning lessons for our students. Exciting, very exciting. Yes. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for joining us for this detailed look at the innovation promise in the Hawaii DOE's 2030 Promise Plan.
This concludes this series on the five promises at the heart of the Hawaii DOE's next strategic plan. In addition to airing on Olelo, all episodes in this series can be found on Olelo Community Media's YouTube channel and are airing on the Hawaii DOE's Teach Channel 356. You can learn more about the Hawaii DOE's strategic work in the 2030 Promise Plan at hawaiipublicschools.org. Thank you to Superintendent Christina Kishimoto and to the educators and students who have joined us to share how they're living out these important promises. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you.